Um, I'm going to focus this talk on observations of young supernova remnants, and by young I mean less than about uh, 500 years uh, old, in non-thermal emission. And the New Star uh, Telescope has allowed us for the first time to make imaging observations of young supernova remnants uh, above the energies of uh, 10 kilo electron volts. And this has provided two new handles uh, on understanding supernova remnants, both the uh, mechanism uh, that explodes uh, the star and also uh, giving us clues as to where the sites of uh, acceleration for the most energetic uh, particles is. So just uh, some background, um, New Star is the first telescope that actually focuses uh, X-rays above 10 uh, energies of 10 kilo electron volts. So of course, uh, wide field coded aperture instruments like uh, Integral or Swift Bat are uh, superb because they can view a large fraction of the sky and detect transient events, bright transient events like uh, gamma ray bursts and do time domain uh, astrophysics in the high energy X-ray band. But they lack sensitivity because fundamentally uh, the backgrounds are very high because they're pinhole cameras and their collecting area is actually less uh, than the area of the detector. Uh, so backgrounds are very high, whereas, of course, when you focus, uh, you have a large area optic focusing the high energy X-rays down uh, to a point. So therefore, uh, we can, New Star achieves sensitivities in the energy band from uh, 3 to 79 kilo electron volts that are many hundreds of times better than uh, we've had in the past. Uh, and this just shows you uh, a comparison. Of course, Chandra and XMM are uh, phenomenal X-ray facilities that work in uh, below 10 kilo electron volts, whereas, as, as I said, New Star is extending the high sensitivity of focusing uh, f from 3 to 79 kilo electron volts. And um, I also want to uh, point out that by coordinating with Chandra and XMM, uh, New Star can cover the entire uh, uh, thermal and non-thermal X-ray band. Um, so this just shows you a comparison of the effective collecting area. Uh, as you can see, uh, New Star extends significant collecting area out to the uh, cutoff in the optics at 79 uh, kilo electron volts uh, compared to Chandra and XMM which have a sharp cutoff uh, around 10. And if you do a sensitivity comparison to uh, instruments like Integral or SWIFT, you can see, and don't, uh, the units are in millicrad, but you can see essentially you achieve uh, factors of many hundred improvements in, in sensitivity. So I like to show this because it just uh, demonstrates qualitatively the improvement uh, that New Star uh, has brought to the high energy X-ray band. Uh, here is an image of the region centered on Sagittarius A star, the galactic center, where there's, a, as you know, a four million solar mass uh, black hole. And this is an image that's about one degree by two degree made with the integral coded mask uh, instrument. And one resolution element in this integral image is the entire roughly 12 arc minute field of view uh, of New Star. So you can see uh, this is a New Star image centered on Sagittarius A star. And for the first time, we can resolve uh, truly diffuse emission. And of interest to this crowd, I'm sure, is that we can resolve non thermal fi filaments uh, where particles are accelerated. So this, uh, on the right there, you see a, that's a, ra a filament that's seen in the radio that we also can now resolve with New Star. This is a false color image where low energy X-rays, meaning uh, 8 to 12 kilo electron volts, are uh, in red and high energy X-rays 
uh, about 15 kiloelectron volts are in blue. And you can see this haze, uh, if you look at Sagittarius A star, which is where the white uh, point is, you can see a blue haze surrounding um, Sagittarius A star. Uh, and this was actually a new component to galactic uh, X-ray emission that was previously unknown. Uh, it's about eight by four parsecs. And we think, we believe it's not actually truly diffuse emission, but rather it's unresolved emission from thousands of point sources, uh, probably uh, magnetic uh, cataclysmic variables, and this was one of the first uh, results. From New Star, which we like to uh, make sure we, we uh, explain to the public, and so this is how they understood the, uh, the press understood the uh, collection of dead stellar remnants that we discovered near uh, Sagittarius A star. But what I want to focus most of this talk on is young supernova remnants, um, because that's the most relevant uh, for this audience. And uh, I just want to point out, this is our first journal cover from New Star, uh, which my postdoc found because he was browsing Roman's bookstore where astrology section is right next to astronomy. And so this is actually our first image release of the Cassiopeia A supernova remnant. And if you can't read the red, it says, uh, this view of the historical supernova remnant Cass A located 11,000 light years away was taken by NASA. Inside, Cassiopeia speaks through Robert Shapiro. I don't know what Cassiopeia said because I didn't actually read the article, but at any rate. Uh, so many of you are probably familiar with this remnant. Uh, it's a source of high energy gamma ray emission. It's the youngest remnant of a core collapse supernova uh, with an estimated explosion date of 1670. Um, the shock velocities are above 1,000 kilometers per, sec per second. And uh, so this provides an excellent opportunity to study in detail the processes of shock uh, acceleration of electrons to high energies. And it's also young enough, and I'm uh, going to talk about this, that uh, we can detect the radioactive decay of uh, titanium-44, which is an element that is produced in the supernova explosion uh, very near the dividing line between uh, what falls back onto the compact object, black hole or neutron star, and what gets ejected out uh, into the uh, uh, interstellar medium. So this was a, we now know from light echoes that this was a type 2b, um, and, uh, sorry, type uh, 1b, and so this, star lost most of its envelope prior to the explosion. And uh, what we're seeing is the shock uh, expanding out into this uh, medium. So let me just remind you the basics of uh, core collapse supernovae. Well, you have a, an evolved massive star, greater than about 10 times uh, the mass of the sun, and when it burns, the core to iron, you, you can't uh, get energy from fusion anymore, and so you, the core collapses, and then the outer layers of the star uh, fall onto the stiff core, bounce, uh, and um, basically the core gets compressed to neutron densities, and in this bounce you get an outward sh shock, which uh, is supposed to explode the star. But the big problem in understanding core collapse and the core collapse mechanism has been, if you consider a spherical explosion uh, and uh, you, do, you model it, you always find that the shock stalls. So it doesn't actually uh, expand out and successfully uh, explode the star. And so it's been an active, a source of research and understanding uh, 
theoretically core collapse, uh, the process of core collapse, to understand what the additional source of energy is that uh, needs to be invoked in order to successfully explode a star. So, uh, neutrinos obviously are produced in copious amounts in, in the process of core collapse, and these neutrinos will interact uh, and heat the material. However, if you consider the best neutrino cross-sections uh, and uh, estimates of the fluxes, just the interactions of neutrinos alone are not enough to reinvigorate this shock and uh, cause the star to explode. So, uh, currently, there are a number of mechanisms that get invoked uh, in order to uh, do one of two things, uh, inject additional energy, uh, sometimes in the form of uh, PDB work, or to uh, keep the material uh, around for longer in the zone where you can get neutrinos uh, to interact. And there are several uh, classes of models that do this. And I'll show you here a video from uh, Adam Burroughs. Okay. That basically, uh, very popular mechanisms are based on low mode instability. So this is large scale convective turbulence. Again, which uh, you can see in this video, let me play it again, as a sort of boiling or bubbling. Uh, this large scale convective turbulence uh, can both do work that explodes the star and it can cause the material to hang around in the high gain zone where the neutrinos uh, interact. Now, uh, it's not really understood whether this mechanism is actually at work because if you have very large scale turbulence, it should you know, cascade very quickly down to smaller scales. However, there are other kinds of instabilities um, that may uh, be at play. One is called the standing accretion shock instability. Uh, this is a, the same instability that, you know, when you put water in your sink and you sort of see, you get a smooth uh, ring that, uh, of water. So this is a bowl of water uh, with uh, bas basically water being in injected into the bowl and you see it start sloshing. Okay, and this is one of these large scale low mode instabilities that may be in work uh, in supernova remnants that uh, can help explode the star. However, this is not, these large scale, I'll say low mode uh, instabilities are not the only mechanism that theorists evoke uh, based on the observation that gamma ray bursts at least the long gamma ray bursts are associated with uh, core collapse. Many models uh, have been generated that invoke the rapid rotation of the star, uh, which can also uh, successfully uh, avoid this stalling of the shock and explode the star. This is a, just a picture of a model from um, Thomas Yonka of one of these ro uh, rotating uh, stellar collapses, and you'll note that if you look at the shape of this explosion, all right, it's, it's fairly uh, bipolar or elongated, whereas if you look at um, uh, this one, right, uh, it's, it's quasi-spherical, but you see uh, basically bubbles in, in the explosion. So, uh, again, one of the big differences between these models is the level of asymmetry. In one case, it's blobby. In the other, it's 
it's elongated or collimated. And so one way that you can try to understand the mechanism of core collapse is by looking at supernova remnants and trying to discern uh, the shape of the explosion from that, uh, from observing the remnant. Now, I'm sure everyone in the audience knows that when you get the uh, core collapse, you get a forward shock that expands out into the interstellar medium, right? And that accelerates particles. And you also have a reverse shock that the material traverses and gets heated by. And it gets heated up to millions of degrees Kelvin and radiates in the X-ray band. And you see, this is a beautiful image of Cassiopeia A taken by Chandra. And you can see the different colors are different elements, iron, silicon, uh, oxygen. And you can then image uh, the remnant and try to discern something about uh, the core collapse mechanism. Now, if you look at uh, Cassiopeia A uh, in iron, however, you get a very different picture than if you look at it in silicon magnesium. Uh, and if you look at it in iron, you would sort of say, okay, that looks rather like the low mode instability mechanism. And if you, uh, others, when people made this image in silicon magnesium said, oh, okay, this is evidence for uh, the rapid rotation of the star prior to the explosion. And people invoked uh, gamma ray burst-like uh, explosions. Now, the issue with uh, doing this in the low energy X-ray band below 10 keV is that really what you're seeing is only the material that's traversed the reverse shock and been shock heated so that uh, what you're not seeing is, is what the core of the explosion uh, looked like. Uh, so you're seeing only uh, the outer layers, which uh, the spatial distribution of the, those elements that have traversed the reverse shock is, dominant, is largely determined by the pre-explosion mass loss and what's going on in the outer layers of the star. Uh, what New Star has added is the ability to image young remnants in uh, radioactive uh, decay of titanium-44. So uh, titanium-44 is produced in the decay chain, um, starting out with nickel, uh, and then eventually titanium, and which decays to calcium and emits uh, gamma rays in uh, in the new star band at 68 and 78 uh, keV. And so this radioactive material is produced at the dividing line, at the mass cut, basically. Uh, so the dividing line between what falls back onto the compact remnant and what get, uh, gets ejected. So it is actually truly mapping the distribution of the uh, core the central part of the explosion. And so uh, New Star made the first maps of Cass A in, in uh, titanium-44. And these maps, if you analyze them, very strongly support this mechanism of low-mode uh, convective instability as being the mechanism that exploded uh, the star in Cassiopeia A. Um, I'll point out that uh, it was predicted by many theorists that the distribution of titanium should look very much like the distribution of iron because they're produced in a similar nuclear burning process, alpha-rich freeze-out. And this shows the new star titanium map in blue and the Chandra iron map in red, and you can see there's very little correlation, and that's one of the things that we're trying to understand this is telling us something about the nucleosynthesis uh, in the remnant. And we've now made three-dimensional maps uh, of, of Cassiopeia A. And this is the titanium in blue and the iron. And it appears that much of the titanium is actually interior to that reverse shock. Uh, and so uh, the reason that you don't see iron there is probably just because it's not shock-heated and to 
see the iron in the low energy X-ray, those atomic transitions, the material must be heated. So in the last few minutes, let me talk a little bit about where the most energetic electrons in uh, this supernova remnant are, um, which is a very interesting story and rather puzzling. So one thing that uh, New Star can do, and we, we've known for a long time that there's high energy X-ray emission out to 100 keV or above coming from uh, Cassiopeia A, but we haven't been able to image it and look at its distribution. So for the first time with New Star, we can actually tell where the highest energy X-ray emission is coming from. And the expectation, of course, would be that you have that forward shock that's, you know, 1,000 kilometers per second plowing out uh, into the interstellar medium, and that ought to be the sites of uh, the most vigorous uh, particle acceleration. You can see here, this just compares six centimeter radio map with the Chandra five to six keV emission to the new star high energy X-ray emission. Now with Chandra, of course, or, an, or XMM, the issue is that you ha if you want to really isolate the non-thermal emission, it's very difficult because you have this uh, very uh, rich set of uh, thermal line emission and thermal continuum emission. So it's actually hard to isolate uh, the non-thermal emission. But the five to six keV band is one where uh, there aren't too many lines. And what New Star has found is actually the most energetic X-ray emission is not coming from the forward shock. It's not coming from these rims. So this is the forward shock. This, uh, and you can see the forward shock in the radio and then the interior ring, which is the reverse shock, all right? It's coming from two isolated knots uh, here, all right? Uh, the vast majority, majority of it. And if you look at the spectrum of those two knots, the spectral index is rather different than the spectral index uh, from the hard emission, non-thermal emission at the forward shock. So this just zooms in on the, uh, on those not regions. And you can see there's really nothing remarkable going on in the radio, but in non-thermal X-rays, uh, these are very bright. And that's a puzzle because it's unclear, you know, the spectral index is quite different, so it's probably not just the forward shock projected you know, we don't have three-dimensional information here. Uh, it probably is some site that's interior uh, to the remnant. And so uh, where the, sh you know, shock velocity should not be that high. And so if you ask, well, okay, so what about the high energy gamma rays? Uh, where are those coming from? It's uh, unclear, but this is the one sigma error regions for uh, Veritas uh, and magic. And you can see there's some tentative, these are one sigma, so it's, it's not entirely clear, but there's some evidence that the TV gamma ray emission is also coming from uh, the same part of the remnant where we see these bright knots. And so I think as uh, the data improves, it, uh, we'll actually see, but it's quite interesting and puzzling to me anyway that um, this, the, the site of the most energetic particle acceleration does not appear to be at the forward shock. So I just, I'm gonna skip, since I have just 59 seconds left. Um, I wanna point out that New Star was launched in 2012. Uh, we had a baseline mission that was two years long and then 2014, uh, we went into a guest observer program. And as part of this guest observer program, we have, uh, we do legacy surveys, and about 20 to 25% of New Star's time is devoted to legacy surveys. Uh, we just com completed the review of AO3 proposals. And uh, one of the programs that I think there's a talk about at this conference is we are doing uh, 
uh, coordinated programs to look at Hawk, Hess, and Veritas sources, uh, both those that are unidentified to try to see if through high energy x-rays we can identify the, um, the actual source of the high energy gamma ray emission uh, and also then uh, combine the data to try to understand the physical mechanisms. And I'll say one great success of this program was actually discovering uh, the uh, source of Hess J1640. Uh, we looked at this and discovered this is a source that's highly obscured, so you can't really detect it well in low energy X rays. But with New Star and the penetrating power of high energy X rays, we were able to discover a pulsar, 200 millisecond pulsar, with a very high uh, spin down. Actually, it's a break index greater than three, which is quite interesting. Um, that is powering the, uh, the X-ray and gamma ray emission. And so I think through future timing studies and spectral studies uh, of uh, high energy gamma ray sources, uh, we hope to be able to help uh, disentangle the mechanisms responsible for the uh, gamma ray emission. So with that, uh, I'll take questions. Thank you so much. Okay, does anybody have any questions? I don't have a specific purpose in mind, but can New Star look at the sun? Yes, so we have looked at the sun. Um, and uh, so interestingly, you know, the, th the quiescent sun, so when it's not solar max, is fairly quiet in energy x-rays unless there's a you know flare going on and one of the things that we are trying to do is look at the quiet sun and detect uh, very small low amplitude flares because this question of what heats the corona is obviously still open one mechan you know one suggestion has been you have uh, nano flares micro flares uh, so the flare spectrum sort of extends down and you have if you have I think one per minute, something like that, that can basically explain coronal heating. Uh, so we just published a paper in AppJ with observations where we've detected uh, basically a micro flare and we're trying to get observations of the sun where it's quiet enough to really constrain the you know, very low amplitude flare spectrum. And the other, uh, thing, this is a little obviously a long shot, but you can actually put constraints on axions through the Primakov effect because, uh, you know, you can convert axions to, to X-rays in the solar magnetic field and that should have a very distinct spatial distribution. So that's uh, also a, a goal, but you also need a quiet sun to do that. Any more questions? Okay, I actually have a question. Um, have you detected titanium in supernova 1987A? We have. I skipped over that just due to time, but since you ask. The interesting thing, so supernova 1987A is of course uh, sort of the uh, very famous remnant because you know the detection of neutrinos from 87A basically confirmed the whole picture of uh, core collapse and the high energy gamma rays uh, came out of 87A early, which showed a high level of mixing. And we observed it in, uh, with New Star for over a megasecond and detected the titanium 44. And the very interesting thing is there's a systemic about half keV redshift of the titanium lines indicating that there was a large scale uh, inhomogeneity or asymmetry in the explosion where most of the material is actually moving away from us as opposed towards us. And this also supports uh, the idea that you have these large scale low mode instabilities. So you can imagine the core sloshing around basically <laughs> and, you know, uh, 
largely, mo you know, moving in a specific direction away uh, from us as it turns out. So this was a surprise uh, to detect this systemic redshift of the lines. You can see that basically there. Any more questions? Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering whether um, Newstar can say anything about the neutron star in Casse. Has has anyone searched for it? Yeah. So um, we it, uh, there is a point source which is very soft, detected by Chandra, which may be the compact uh, remnant. There's nothing. You know, the emission from the neutron star is thermal and peaks in the low energy X-ray. So there's not, and uh, given New Star's spatial resolution, there's really not much, you know, that, that we can add. Um. Thank you. All right, any more questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Fiona again for a great talk. Thank you.